Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. A familiar passage, I'm sure, but it's good to be reminded of things that we have forgotten. Do you tend to forget some basic things about the Lord? I do. Maybe I'm talking about myself, but in the, the details of life, it's easy to forget the most obvious things. I've noticed that in times of real stress, we even question things we thought we would never question. We forget, we just kind of assume in the good seasons that we are now exempt from certain trials or troubles that might come our way. And so life is constantly changing, amen? And so I just want to remind you of some basic things about God's provision and care for you. It's here at the beginning of the year, and what we need to remember is that God is always preparing us for new things that he wants to do. It doesn't really matter how old you are, what season you are in life, the Lord is always getting you ready for something new. Now, you might think you have it all figured out. You might know who you are, your basic gifts, your calling in life, but as the seasons change, suddenly your role changes, and it can throw you off. I used to think that as I got older, this Christian life would get easier. Now, I know you're laughing because you know how silly that is. In many ways, it is easier because I know the Lord better. I trust him more. I don't freak out like I did when I was young, in my 50s. (laughs) But still, there is something just new to learn about the Lord, and I just need to be reminded to trust the Lord with every new season. And so, I want to encourage you to be looking at what God is doing. Here's three questions that are important for you. What did God do in your life last year? Often God is working and we got excited about it, we enjoyed it, and then we forgot about it. Take a second and write down the the concrete things that God did in your life last year because those may be an indicator of what God is preparing you for next. Second question What do you think God is preparing you for? Many times I would have an idea, man, I I think God's doing this. And I would think, well, it probably isn't that. I'll just wait and see what God does. And how many times I've learned that God told me ahead of time exactly what he was doing. And I've learned to pay attention. Don't jump ahead and think you have it all figured out. But you learn that you are hearing from the Lord. Even as I just said that, I remember back in my 20s when I was learning to hear the Lord's voice. I was on a missions trip in England, playing in a band, sitting in a church in Bradford, England. And if you know England, people would say, why would you ever go to Bradford? It was not really a... It's not like London or York or other places. And I was probably 25 or 26, sitting in a worship service like this, and the Lord told me to share something out loud. And I said, God, I don't do that. I was raised a good Baptist boy, and we don't do that kind of thing. But my heart was about to jump out of my chest And while I was busy arguing with the Lord, the man sitting next to me said exactly the words that were on my mind to share. 
And I said to God, God, if you will use me again, I will not, I will not tell you no. Now the Lord knew I was gonna say no, but he was teaching me how to hear and how to obey. Because you see, at that time, I didn't even know if it was the Lord's voice I was hearing. I was learning what that even sounded like. My pounding heart was a good indicator that it wasn't me. We have a lot of crazy thoughts, so a lot of you are thinking things you should probably keep to yourself right now. (laughs) They're probably not the Lord. But you learn those times when the Lord is speaking and is compelling you to say something or do something. So what is it, if you wrote down a couple of ideas, what do you think God is maybe leading you to do this year? Now, the third question is the hardest. Are you ready? What changes is God asking you to make in your life? If God is preparing you for something to do, what is it that needs to change? Now, I'm not talking about some secret sin or something that needs to get out of your life, but just something about your routine or decisions you're making that might be getting in the way, freeing up time to do this other thing. I love for God to do something in my life, but please don't make any changes. And I've I've probably shared this before, but it comes to mind again. There are two prayers that people have in their Christian life. The two most common prayers. Do you want to know what they are? Do you want to know what they are? Okay, I expect some interaction here. (laughs) Number one, God, what is your will for me? How many of you have prayed that prayer? We all have. And then once God answers that prayer, the second most common prayer is, God, do I have to do that? <laughs> Not always, but you realize, you know, we, we, we think if when I finally discover God's will for my life, then there's just gonna be peace, everything's gonna work together, it, I'm just gonna be in a groove from that moment on. And you realize it's not just easy. There are changes, there are sacrifices, there are areas in your life that need to grow and allow your life to be transformed. Did you get those three questions? What did God do in your life last year? What do you think God is doing in the coming year? And what changes is God asking you to make so that you can grow, so that you can be usable in this way? True story, a man went to the doctor, short of breath, the doctor said, well, we just need to get you on an exercise routine. I want you to start walking a little bit every day. And then we need to get you to start running a little bit each day. And just slowly increase your endurance. In six months, I want you to come back and see me. We're gonna check check out your heart and everything again. And six months later, he came back to the doctor. The doctor said, now this is a true story. How's it going with the running? And the man said, well, I had to quit. What's the next question? Why? The man said, the wind kept blowing out my cigarette. (laughs) I stole that from Paul Harvey. True story. You see, I would never do anything like that in my life. You understand. I am always cooperative with the Lord. We're all kind of like that a little bit, aren't we? It's not just that we don't know God's will. It's we sometimes resist. Whatever God asks you to do, he'll enable you to do. That's a promise we have. This is a couple of great promises in Philippians. Now, I'm gonna go to Philippians 4, but all of Philippians has some amazing promises. And in those times of trusting God for what's next, we need to fall back, and Pastor Chuck would tell us this. 
when you're at a time when you don't know what is next, fall back on what you do know. What we do know, Philippians 1, 6, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until, until the day of Jesus Christ. So God has plainly started a work in your life. He will be faithful to complete it if you will cooperate. Philippians 2, 13 God is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. To will and to do. Those are two different things. God enables me to do it, gives me the ability to do something, and he helps me to be willing to do the very thing he sent me to do. And a promise from Ephesians 2.10, it's one of my favorites. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I have counted on that verse since my early 20s. I grew up the son of an alcoholic father, and because of that, among other things, I was really aimless in life. I had no direction, very little parental input, I, I don't think I became an adult until I was uh, 30 years old or 35. I developed very late. Um, I was a millennial when they didn't even know the term. And I knew, if I knew anything, God had something planned for me, and I could count on that. And God did work out his plans for me. So God has prepared a work for you to do, but he's preparing you for that work. And I love that idea that God has something for me to do, and he shaped me for that work, and he'll just hold it for me. It's like, you know, buying a brand new car for your 15-year-old teenager and saying, I have this brand new car for you when you're ready to handle the responsibility and when you have a driver's license. Then I will give you the car. Philippians 4 has three more promises that I want to give to you this morning that I think are important, basic, basic reminders for your coming year. Number one is the reminder of the promise of the peace of God in difficulty. Second, the promise of the power of God in our weakness. And third, the promise of the supply of God. The peace of God, the power of God, and the supply of God. The first one, verses four through nine, the promise of the peace of God. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand or the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There is so much in those few verses right there. Worry had crept into the church at Philippi. It was causing debate and division, which is such a common ex uh, experience in many churches. All churches experience things that come in, can upset a church. People want to you know, discuss it, disagree over it. And it's so easy to react rather than wait to be patient. What's really going on? I've noticed people are so prone to jumping to conclusions and taking sides. The Greek word for anxious, be anxious for nothing, in verse six means to be pulled in different directions. That's what anxiety does. It pulls you this way, and it pulls you this way, and you think, if I can just figure this out, if I can just get an answer, then I will have peace. Now, is that true? And even if you did get an answer, does it guarantee that you're gonna have peace? 
Because no, then you want to jump in and fix it and tell everybody what to do. Hypothetically, maybe not you, but probably. Haven't you learned over the years that God has ways of working things out that are way beyond anything we would have done? And to just calm down. And you don't, you don't really know all the circumstances. And you think, wow, God is being patient even with those difficult people, which, by the way, is probably never you. <laughs> God is patient. God has been patient with me when I was being difficult and allowing me to repent or grow or in, grow in the middle of the circumstance. God is so patient, and I am not patient. You're nodding your head at me like you know that about me. That's a little bit judgmental. I just don't. I'm going to cut this message short. The Old English root for that word anxious means to strangle. That's what you want to do with the person that's irritating you. But it's often wrong thinking, wrong emotions about circumstances or people, and you think, if I can get this worked out in my mind, then I'll have peace. But it's not peace that comes from understanding, it's peace that surpasses understanding. Now, to me, I don't, I, I don't quite understand, I don't understand that. I need to understand this, and then I'll have peace. But I've noticed in my life, as uncertainty or trials last longer and longer, you are forced into a place where you're just going to trust the Lord. And people say, well, I don't see any way to deal with this, I guess we should pray about it as if that's the last thing we should ever do. And we all know how silly that is. I, well, I don't know what to do, I guess we should just pray about it. Well, that's so spiritual of you to say that. I can't change my feelings, but I can change what I'm thinking about. Did you hear me? Have you ever tried to control your feelings? You can't, but you can change what you are thinking about. And that's exactly what Paul says. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. He throws that in. Prayer is making, as these thoughts come to your mind, your reaction is not to don't think about it, but pray about it. Say, God, what's going on here? Let me pray for that person. It becomes a reflex, casting your cares on the Lord. Supplication is sharing your needs about a problem. Thanksgiving is important because when you pray about a problem with thanksgiving, that protects you from anxiety. You say, you cannot be thankful in prayer and be full of anxiety. Those two things don't go together. Now, what are you being thankful about? The fact that God is going to work this out. God, I have no idea how you're gonna work this out, but I am thankful that I can come and talk to you about this And I am thankful that you know what's going on and you are able to work this out. Thankfulness in prayer protects you from that strangling anxiety. Verses eight and nine, Paul writes, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, 
meditate on these things, which means to think over and over. Keep thinking about it. Keep thinking about those things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Those are the words of someone of experience. You, by experience, we don't say, well, don't worry about that. We say, yeah, that's upsetting. But if you pray, then the Lord will be with you and give you peace. What, what you're worried about is upsetting. It might be worthy of a lot of anxiety, but it doesn't do any good. How many of you could point to one problem that anxiety fixed? Anything? Nothing. So you look back and you say, why did, why did I waste my emotional energy and all of my days worrying about that thing? It didn't accomplish anything. But it made you feel like you were doing something, right? It doesn't accomplish anything. Now, concern, yes. Pray about it. If there's anything to do, maybe the Lord can give you direction. James said if you lack wisdom and pray for wisdom, God will give it to you. One of my other life verses along with Ephesians 2.10 is Romans 8.28. God causes all things to work together for good for those who, do you know the rest of the verse? who love God and who are called according to his purpose. I have no idea how God does that. God is able to take all the things that have happened to me, mistakes I have made, things other people have done to me, circumstances that are going on in the world, in politics, and when I am a person who loves him and my heart is open to him, and when I ultimately want his calling, his purpose for my life, God is able to take it all and work it for my good. That's a puzzle I could never solve. My wife loves jigsaw puzzles. I could not sit there five minutes and do one. But it is my job to buy her a new jigsaw puzzle, a thousand pieces or more, I'm trying to find the more complicated ones, and she loves to sit there and put them together. And I say, God bless you. I'm not doing that. How God takes all the pieces of our lives and works them for our good, I don't know. But how many of you see, have seen God do it? Let me see your hands. Okay. The worst of times in my life, in our life, God has used to, first of all, shape my life. I know I am a more mature man who depends on the Lord now because of extremely difficult things that I've had to go through. And I look back now, and I, I know in the middle of it, I would say, God, I can't do this anymore. God, I can do this until Friday. Have you ever prayed that prayer? God, I'm trusting you, but I'm gonna need an answer by Friday. And God has allowed in, in our life at times trials to go on for months or a couple of years. And prolonged trials expose things in your life that you didn't know were there. Attitudes that need to come out. It's the refining fire. But most of all, I learned that when I was completely without any strength, the Lord was with me. You see, I used to think God could work as long as I was strong. But God allowed me to completely run out of strength, run out of ideas. I, I was de clinically depressed, I think. And then God did things that I could never do, and secondly, I could never claim credit for doing. 
And those are some of the most liberating times in your life. It's how we ended up in Portland. I never would have left California. I grew up in California, and there's no life outside of California, you think, when you grow up there. But God put us through things that caused us to come to the Northwest, and that's how I ended up at Calvary Chapel Portland for 23 years. I arrived in Portland two weeks after their pastor just suddenly resigned. So the Lord was preparing me for a work that I was resisting. I was praying all the time, God, put me in ministry. Help prepare me for ministry. And I was resisting when he was doing that very thing. The faithfulness of God is absolutely amazing. Faithful when I'm stubborn. Faithful when I want to take control. Romans 8.28 was the verse that I really learned during that time. That God took everything that I was going through, I say I, like my wife is not sitting here, but we went through it. It challenged our marriage. We had three little girls, six, eight, and ten. They're all in their 30s now. Um, we have eight grandkids and one on the way. And we're thankful for the hardest of times that really made us grown-ups and able to not just tell people to trust the Lord and the Lord is faithful, but to actually believe, believe it, the sufficiency. We have the promise of the peace of God and in the crazy emotions, put your mind on the good things, on the promises of God, and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard. That word guard is like a soldier standing at the gate. The soldier is standing watch, and when Bad ideas, wrong feelings come, that guard is standing there going, not today. The promise of the peace of God. Second is the promise of the power of God. Verses 11 to 13, Paul says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, how many of you have an old analog Bible with you today? Analog means print, not digital. You didn't know what I meant by analog. I'm trying to sound hip this morning. In your printed Bible, how many of you have that underlined or highlighted, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? How did Paul become so convinced of that truth? I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. He said I had to learn it. How did he learn it? He tells you right in these verses, he tells you that in my ministry, I have gone through times where I abounded. It's in his financial, his physical needs. Times when I had a, an abundance of God's supply. But there were other times when I was abased. I didn't have what I needed. I was in prison. I was shipwrecked. I was all kinds of troubles that Paul had to go through. When you go through those different seasons in life, you learn that God was with you in both seasons. When you're still learning about the power of God and the presence of God, you think, well, if I'm walking in the spirit of God, if God is with me, then I'm always gonna have this sense of confidence. God is always gonna be providing. But what if God sends you off to do something where there's great sacrifice? A missionary or Paul traveling as an apostle. 
You see, he suffered because he was in God's will. Do you know that? He suffered because he was in God's will. Our simplistic thinking is, if I'm in God's will, I will not suffer or not very much. But what you learn in the seasons of abounding and the seasons of being abased is that you can do it. You learn that God is with you and you learn that he is the same toward you. During that season where we really suffered and it was great trials and God was taking things away and we didn't have enough money, it exposed in me a works mentality. I thought, well, God, I've been faithful. I've been serving you. How dare you allow this to happen to me? I didn't even know I thought that way until the trial came. And that's what the refining fire does to you. It exposes these wrong ideas. Because you are faithful, God doesn't owe you more than when you are not faithful. Because you see, God's grace was never earned. You didn't earn it to begin with. Now, of course, faithfulness brings blessings. So that's not permission to go be a flake. But we do have to get out of our thinking in some way that we deserved blessings. And just to rest in the fact that God is gracious and God wants to give to you and he, is, he loves you the same, sometimes in good times or in bad times. I do a lot of ministry. I, when I quit, left Calvary Chapel, Portland, the end of 2016, I was essentially quitting my full-time job to go do what I do now with Poiman Ministries. Now, I'm more like a missionary. I don't get a salary from Poiman. And people will help support me doing this. And it was quite a freak out. God, how is this going to work? And it's amazing, even at this time in, in our aged lives, to see how God has provided for these past six years. And to learn these same lessons over and over and over again. It's really, really wonderful. Paul is saying, I've discovered something that I pray all of you discover, that whatever God is leading you to do, you can do it. If that's what he's leading you to do, he's not saying you can go do whatever you want and God will be with you. See, God provides for what he calls us to do. As God sent Paul out to, to travel and all the troubles that would come his way, he goes, I can do it. The Lord's with me. There's no reason to be panicked. The third promise is the promise of the supply of God. That's often what we're worried about. We're worried about finances or, you know, the needs of our lives. In verse 19, Paul says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, the church at Philippi was not a wealthy church. They were a poor church. And yet, of all the churches that Paul ministered to, they were one of the main churches that helped Paul financially. And Paul says, look, God will supply all that you need. All that you need. Their gift helped him. Paul at times worked. And it's, it's amazing to learn God providing peace for us, 
providing power for us, but also providing for us all financially. It's amazing. That their gift, he says, was a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 to 10, he says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work, as it is written. He has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So if you had any idea, inkling, suspicion of what God might be doing next in your life this year, you might just as easy say, well, I don't see any way that could happen. So you don't want to just discount what God might do because you can't see how the circumstances or the finances would come together. I'm really good at that. I think I know what God is doing, but that's probably not going to happen. I kind of sabotage it before we even get started. Because if there's anything I'm good at, it's just plodding along faithfully in old things. I don't need rapid change all the time. If there's anything I can prove that I am faithful, I'm in it for the long run. And I thought at times I was being virtuous. There was some virtue. When maybe there's a time to say, God, what's next? It's so important that you have hope in your life. That basic word hope is the anticipation of good things in the future. You know, when you lose hope, it's, it's kind of over. Hope is not just circumstances working out in your life. That's happiness. The word happy comes from the word chance. Hap is chance. And so when things just happen to work out and they work out in your favor, then you're happy. But that really doesn't last very long, does it? Hope is what the Lord gives us. Hope is not circumstances working out and then not working out. Hope is the assurance of good things in the future. When circumstances aren't going well, did our promise of hope change? No, it didn't change. Because you see, God working things out in the future for you had nothing to do with circumstances. It had everything to do with his will, his plans, his provision. Why don't you guys come on up, worship team, as we're just closing this up. One thing I learned as the child of an alcoholic is to never expect good things to work out for me. In fact, I've shared in my testimony that as a child, I was trained to be hopeless. I look back, and that training was week after week, my father making promises that he never kept. You see, when, when God gives us a promise, we expect it to be kept. But when a parent makes a promise and never keeps that promise, you learn to stop expecting that promise to be kept. And in fact, you don't just stop believing the word of that parent or whoever it is. You start to go way the other side, and if anything might work out for you, you just automatically say, well, that's probably not for me. 
And for many years, I would believe the good things in, in, the, in the God's word, but I didn't necessarily think they were for me. You see, I was trained to be hopeless. I am not there anymore. Through the seasons of abundance, the seasons of suffering, that thinking got worked out of me. I learned to think that, uh, learned that even in the, the, the hardest of times, God was still with me. In the hardest of times, God was working things out. And I have seen this over and over and over again. These aren't lessons for your young years. These are lessons for your whole life. What's next? What is next for each of you? You see, God is not finished, is he? God is still faithful. You have the promise that he who has begun a good work will be faithful to complete it until that day. What is that day? That day when you see the Lord face to face. There's still some problems to work out in some of your lives, I think. You're supposed to laugh when I say things like that. <laughs> we're still growing, we're still learning. We're being examples to other people around us. And I, for one, you just need to be reminded not to freak out, but just to say, Lord, what are you doing next? And I can do it. Whatever you want me to do, I can do it. Why don't you stand with me, and I want to pray for you. And we'll have a closing song here this morning. But how many of you might be able to say, that the Lord spoke to you today. Let me see your hands. I want you to take note of the specific things that God spoke to you today. Remembering what he did last year, what you think he might be doing this year, the changes that need to happen, the reminders of, a pro of promises maybe you've forgotten about, the wasted time in anxiety that you're giving over to things that aren't gonna be changed at all by your worry. But to cast your cares on the Lord. You can't change your feelings. You can change what you're thinking about. Lord, we all stand before you this morning. We just confess that we have good days and bad days, and we just love, Lord, that you are faithful, you are patient with us, you're teaching us new and reminding us of old lessons. And Lord, may we have hope for the future, hope for our families, hope for our community, that you would give us a reason to just be excited about this year and new work. We thank you for your provision. And if any of us is in a season of lacking, Lord, we learn to be content because it's temporary. And when the provision comes, we'll learn to be content there. But in both seasons, Lord, may our heart be set on you not distracted by abundance or worry or anything else. But ultimately, Lord, what you want is that we love you with all of our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and speaking to us this morning. We pray in your name. Amen. Um, before we get started, I um, was reminded that we do have food in the fellowship hall after church. Um, there's bread, there's meat. Uh, there's things that you might need, so feel free to go back there and grab it after the service. Let's go ahead and worship together.
thank you so much for never letting go of us. Lord, we may stray from you, but Lord, you are always there with us. And Lord, we're so thankful. Lord, we're so thankful that um, Pastor McNabb's message just ties into all these songs, Lord. It's just amazing how that works out. And Lord, we are so thankful that you've given us purpose. We ask that, uh, you know, our open our hearts to see what you have planned for us, Lord, and for us to be able to accept it and to accept the change that you need for us to do. Lord, we love you so much, and uh, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone. Don't forget food in the back. <laughs>